you know, we're, we're trying to grow the right way. We're trying to do the right things. We're caring about the community and trying to support it the best we can. And it's a, it's an honor and a pr privilege to, uh, to work at such a great company. Hello, everybody. Welcome to OKCoin Live. We're here today for one of our very exciting, um, very exciting episodes. We're here today to talk about is crypto getting more mainstream? I think it is. We're here today with the CMO of Chain, Mike. Mike, we're very excited to have you here to talk to us about Chain and also about crypto. Thank you for having me. Um, joining us today is uh, Harrison, who's on the listings team with me, and Devika, who's also on the listings team, as I just said. Awesome. Excited to have you, Mike. Um, yeah, I think excited to talk with you guys. Awesome. Uh, I think I think where we wanted to start start things off, uh, just giving our customers, our listeners, a chance to, to hear where you came from, what your background is, and what led you here. Yeah, no, totally. Um, so my name is Mike Heron. I'm the CMO at Chain, um, also known as Chain.com. Uh, I'm, I'm a lifelong marketer. Uh, I've, I've been in the marketing world in some way, shape, or form for almost 25 years now. Um, started out in the sports industry, um, quickly worked my way into um, large Fortune 500 level organizations, uh, worked with probably every big brand you can think of and tons you've never even heard of. Um, been, been involved in the, uh, in the crypto side for uh, almost four years now. Um, had, a, had a client, a couple of clients uh, in a past life that uh, uh, were blockchain crypto companies um, and uh, did some advisory work and uh, recently came on board uh, at Chain. Prior to this, I was the uh, global head of marketing for a company called Luca um, that does um, blockchain uh, data and software services, uh, really focused on the institutional side. Um, and Chain uh, is, is, a, is a similar animal, really focusing on uh, blockchain technology and you know, helping brands that have really lived in the Web 2 space sort of transfer over into Web 3. So it's, uh, it's been a fun challenge in the, the last four or five months since I've been here. Yeah, you know, I think a lot of people heard and saw the the news about the Tiffany's NFTs that were powered by Chain. So, you know, we're very interested in speaking about that. But, you know, just before we talk about Tiffany's and all the cool stuff that Chain is doing, I'm really curious, you know, what made you transition into the crypto industry? You know, I saw before Luca, your last job was in the packaging space, you know, in marketing your packaging. So that's a pretty big jump. Like, how do you go from that to crypto? Yeah, it's a pretty big jump, and, and that is a that is a long, long, long story. So I will do my best to sort of condense it down. Um, again, prior to that, I had a I had a stint. Um, well, I turned forty, and and at that point in time in my life, I had always worked client side, and I decided that I really wanted to see how the sausage was made from an agency perspective. Right, I had worked with all of these amazing amazing agency partners in the past, so I transitioned into that. And, and like I mentioned, one of my clients was a blockchain company, and I just sort of fell in love with it. I'm a storyteller at, at sort of my core. So when you start getting into this world of crypto and blockchain and Web3, right, it's there's these amazing stories you can tell and, and all of these amazing problems you can solve, thinking of it from a different way. So um, at that point in time, I knew that I was going to get back into the crypto and blockchain space, uh, but for some reasons I needed to step out of it for a moment. Um, but yeah, very, very diverse background. And again, the, the blockchain space, you know, and I tell people this all of the time is, you know, the traditional financial world has been the same for hundreds of years, right? It's a system built on people in the middle. And, you know, when you really look at sort of what companies like Chain are trying to do is really sort of build that infrastructure for the future of global finance and global commerce. And, you know, that to me is, you know, a dad of four, you know, is, is, is a really cool opportunity for me to get to sort of shape and change the way that the world will operate, you know, when I'm long gone. That's amazing. Uh, that gets me excited just to, to continue this converse, conversation. Um, curious, you, you mentioned transitioning companies from Web 2 to Web 3. Um, what are some of the roadblocks that you see with that? Like what what things have you found interesting and, and kind of what advice do you give to companies who are thinking about it? Yeah, you know, I, I, I think I think there's a couple of things. Um, what I've realized very quickly in this space is there is this sort of 
there is this different spectrum of, of people in this world. Um, I'll use an example that I use frequently is a couple of years back at Bitcoin Miami, I sat at lunch with the head of global investments or, or excuse me, the head of global alternative investments for this massive, massive traditional finance company. And he was wearing a sport coat that probably cost as much as my car. And on the other hand, I'm sitting next to a 17 year old kid that, you know, has $30 million worth of Dogecoin in his wallet and still lives in his mom's basement. And the difference is, is that when we look at that sort of dichotomy from group to group, your, your expectation is the kid doesn't know anything. And, you know, the guy in the really fancy sport coat with the title knows it all. And the truth of the matter is, is that that's sort of the difference in this world and what makes it so powerful is is really that community of you know the younger generation that's really engaging this and you know the dinosaurs of this world like myself right like we're all trying to catch up and figure out like what our kids are talking about and you know what is this new generation thinking um so i mean i think the biggest thing is you know know your audience don't assume that people know this stuff don't assume they don't um you know, I've talked to some people that are, you know, very, very senior in their career that know this inside and out. And, you know, and other people are just just a directive from their CEO of, hey, go figure out this blockchain stuff. Um, so, again, it's, you know, when it comes to business, when it comes to marketing in general, right, it's about knowing your audience and, and, and understanding, you know, how to solve the problems that, that they have. Um, but yeah, it's been a it's been an interesting challenge. I'll tell you that. It's, you know, it's funny you talk about these big tech companies and these big kind of traditional Web2 companies and the CEO saying, go figure out what to do with blockchain. So Alex and I were both on the listening team at OKCoin. We both used to work at Microsoft before this um, on the global corporate strategy team. And we were told back in 2017, go figure out this blockchain thing. Uh, so, you know, it rings very true to us, which is saying, you know, big tech companies are listening and they're curious and they have been curious for a long time. But... You know, based on my experience, um, outdated as it is now, there was still a lot of resistance back then to engaging with crypto um, and engaging with Web2 models. So, you know, can you tell us about how how does Chain help companies do that? Like, how does it make it easier? How does it make it better? Like, what does it do for these companies? Yeah, for sure. And, and it's, a, it's a great question. You know, I think that I think the biggest the biggest hurdle that a lot of these companies have sort of transitioning from the web two world to the web three world is just the understanding of the community. And, you know, this is, this is unlike anything I think we've, we've really ever seen um, that the community drives all of this. So, so what we do at chain is, is we have products and services um, that make this transition easier. Um, you know, our, our sort of core product is what we call chain sequence. It's our ledger as a service, you know, before anybody can sort of dive into the blockchain space, there's a lot of really basic questions they have around that. And that sequence product makes that a lot easier for them. You know, then we have a product called chain cloud, which is really sort of our node and API service. Um, and that really is going to be allowing those developers to connect things differently. The beautiful part is that we can build any of these products for you or allow your developers access to any of the different blockchains that are available. So we can help you and your organization understand what makes one blockchain different from the other and why this specific protocol or this specific you know, execution might be better for you in the long term. Uh, and then most recently, you, excuse me, most recently you mentioned earlier, um, you know, our chain NFT is a service platform, um, which just made a, a very large splash with uh, our partners at Tiffany and co. Uh, and, and that's really another example of how we're trying to, we're trying to make things easier. Um, you know, a brand like Tiffany's that is, you know, globally renowned and, you know, one of the largest brands in the world, right? It's a, it's a, it's an old institution and, you know, Alexander Arnault, the, the, the executive vice president of that company, right, is very bullish on the crypto space. And, you know, what, what we sort of do is we offer that sort of soup to nuts white glove service of everything from consulting and, um, you know, concepting through design and website development and marketing and social and PR. Um, we also used our own products to build the smart contracts, right? We used our own products to build the whole web experience. So, so all of the things that we're doing is really about simplifying 
something that's generally pretty complicated. And if you've tried to develop, if you've tried to hire a developer or an engineer lately, um, you know, it's, it's very much in demand. So if we can simplify that and uh, make it easier for an organization, it's, it's, it's what we try to do on a daily basis. Interesting. And um, I mean, Tiffany's, the launch went amazingly well. I don't know for the, the folks that haven't seen it, maybe um, you could share some of the details around that. I have a follow-up question, but maybe sharing that. Yeah, yeah, you. yeah. No, I'd be happy to. Um, you know, we were, we were lucky enough that um, Alexander and my CEO, Deepak, uh, who are both CryptoPunk holders, um, have a great relationship. Um, they met on Twitter a while back when, uh, when Alexander had posted the CryptoPunk pendant that um, the amazing artisans that Tiffany had built for him for, for his own private use. And, you know, my CEO Deepak had reached out and said, this is cool. I want one of these for myself. And we talked about the community earlier, right? And that's really sort of how this came to be. And, you know, we, we wanted to try to do something that was unique, that had a little bit of a different utility. You know, how do you get an iconic brand like Tiffany's into the Web3 space. And, you know, we were really lucky that the Tiffany team embraced all of our ideas and we really collaborated really, really well together. Um, so, so the project, uh, the project, if, if, if listeners and viewers don't know, um, if, if you have a crypto punk or you wanted to purchase a crypto punk, uh, a Tiffany and co artisan would hand build uh, a gold pendant, um, exactly to the replica of your crypto punk or as closely as they possibly could complete one of one extremely limited edition um you know real piece of custom jewelry uh, and then the certificate of authenticity comes as an actual nft render of that so we're trying to tie that digital uh, world to the physical world and obviously tiffany has owned the the physical world of jewelry for the last hundred years or so uh, and it was just really a great opportunity for us to sort of bridge that together um, you know, if you look at, you know, the price of that product, you know, a lot of people were um, really taken aback by that. But when you look at the, uh, the custom options and you look at the larger picture of what actually goes into it, it's a tremendous value, especially when you're talking about something one of one from, you know, a world leading jeweler like Tiffany & Co. Yeah. And they sold out in 22 minutes, which was really good as well. Yeah, twelve and a half million dollars in twenty two minutes. That's uh that's back to like October, October, November NFT craze levels, I think. Yeah. Now it's sold out in twenty two minutes. There were probably twenty two weeks of work that went into it. Um, but it was it was a great collaboration, right? Like, you know, as a marketer, I've had an opportunity to work with, you know, a number of amazing brands and influencers in the past, but you know, really having a brand like Tiffany and Co. on your resume and being able to talk with folks like you about it is is just a humbling experience, I have to tell you. Yeah. Um, no, I mean, amazing. Congrats on all the hard work. That's awesome. Um, we give all the credit to Tiffany and co. I mean, they were, they were the ones that did most of the heavy lifting and they had to deal with us. So they should get the credit. <laughs> so humble. Um, and I guess a follow up to that, like, so I, um, I saw recently in, in early July, Chris Brown launched an NFT project went horribly wrong. Um, I think they only sold a thousand of uh, 10,000 NFTs. I invested in, uh, and you know, Chris Brown's obviously a super famous uh, musician and has a, a great following. So I'm, I'm very surprised by that. Um, also, I invested in um, this Pride Icons NFT project, really cool LGBTQ uh, project, uh, leveraging the pop-up parties community, which I don't know if you guys have heard of, but uh, they do these really cool themed parties around the world, strong community, also failed pretty miserably. Um, I guess, what, what is it about Tiffany's? What do you think went well? Is it something that you guys did in particular? I know that you like to be humble, but i um, curious if there's anything around the launch that kind of helped you to uh, support Tiffany's in this successful endeavor. Yeah. I, have a, I have a quick follow on to that question sure. as well, which is, you know, how do you see the value of the NFTs and the Tiffany's necklaces actually sustaining value over time, even if they do launch successfully? Yeah, I, I think, I think when it comes to being successful in this space, right, all of the credit goes to Alexander and Deepak. Um, they're in this space. They live it on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, they understand how the community works. And I think a lot of times 
you know, with these other companies, right? It's, they don't have the community's best interest potentially, you know, at, at the forefront of their minds. And, and I think from our perspective, right, the Tiffany and co group was so passionate about this and they wanted it to work so badly. Um, you know, and Deepak obviously is ridiculously passionate about this space. And, and I think it comes through and when you're doing things you're excited about and when you're doing things you love, it, it doesn't become business. It doesn't become part of a job. It becomes a passion project. And, and, and I can't speak for either of them, but I would, I would say that this probably was a big passion project for them. So, you know, our teams were driven hard. You know, we, we worked long hours. We wanted this to be a flawless execution because a brand like Tiffany & Co, that's what they expect. And, and that's the type of brand that we at Chain want to align ourselves with. So, um, you know, I, I, I'd like to say we got lucky but I, I think it's just from the leadership side, those those two really experienced sort of Web3 crypto punk owners, right? They knew where the pitfalls were and we were just lucky enough to have their leadership and we planned for them ahead of time. Were there mistakes? Of course there were. You know, were there things on the back end that we would have liked to have gone smoother? Of course, but this is all new, right? We're, we're really sort of paving this path and, and, and really diving into, you know, sort of the unknown when it comes to some of this stuff. Uh, but we learn, we, we react and we adapt. And, you know, it was a, it was a great, uh, it was a great exposure piece for, uh, for Tiffany and company. And, you know, we're just, we're just honored to be a part of it. So, you know, I think, you know, I'd love to learn a little bit more about what else, you know, chain does with chain cloud and chain sequence. But before that, I want to stay to the, you know, stay on the NFT theme for one second and ask, you know, getting a conglomerate like LVMH and, you know, getting, getting the likes of Tiffany's to really sponsor and run and own something which, like an NFT project. You know, I feel like that really does give credibility to the space more than more than artists, right? So, you know, as Harrison mentioned, a lot of artists have done this in the past too, but having that kind of conglomerate behind you, which signifies luxury and signifies opulence in some ways, right? And quality, really, I think. Um, you know, do you see kind of going off this launch for Tiffany's more web two brands and just whether is it do you think it's going to be just jewelry brands or is it going to be like you know just luxury brands or do you see more traditional other web two brands also getting into this nft space it, it yeah i think i i think and i hope that this tiffany's project really is sort of the catalyst to bring a lot of other brands in i think the i think the art side of nfts is fantastic but there's a lot of other utility that you know that technology can bring and by trying to bridge that digital and physical world like we were able to do you know for our clients so successfully this past couple of weeks right i think it i think it opens the door for other things we've been contacted by a lot of different companies that have had questions for us and we've been lucky enough to sort of brainstorm around and i think when you can take and tie it to something that has that exclusivity, right? There are very, very, very few people in this world that have a custom Tiffany & Co. piece of jewelry, right? That exclusivity is really what, you know, you're purchasing at this point. Um, but I think, the, I think the big thing is, is that they, can, they see that it can be done, right? They, they, they can follow along. They have somebody like Chain or any of the other companies out there that can help them along the way and really consult. Because again, I feel like the companies that haven't done it well, um, you know, and there are others that you haven't mentioned that come to my mind, right? But it's, it's never been about the community. It's never been about the exclusivity. It's about, hey, buy this for 3X the retail value and you get a custom color, right? It's, about, you know, just buy another piece of artwork that is just another piece of artwork. And, and we all love art and it's a great utility for NFTs, but there's just so many other things it can do. I mean, we're talking, we're talking with companies about tokenizing experiences from, oper from our operations side of a business, from a security side of a business. Um, you know, we're, we're talking with lots of people. I was on a call earlier with a gentleman that's doing some amazing work in, in the real estate space. Um, working with the California DMV to tokenize car titles. Um, so when you think about those things, right, it's it's really only limited by our imagination and, and the, that utility of that NFT, right, can really be anything. So my hope is, is that this allows other companies to be like, hey, it's not just an art project, right? We can have other utilities for it. I mean, I envision a world where all high-end jewelry at some point in time or every vehicle, you know, the title or the certificate of authenticity is, is some form of NFT. Um, I mean, I've got 
sports memorabilia that came with a certificate of authenticity that I couldn't tell you where it was. But if it's in my digital wallet, I, I'll have it forever. So I think there's a lot of things there that uh, will really bring a lot of other brands into the space. I hope so. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I, and I don't, uh, I don't mean to bring the feds into this, but I think there's a lot. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of ways for the government to become more efficient by accessing blockchain technology. You mentioned, uh, you know, the DMV. <clears throat> I've also seen in in Utah actually uh, they're tokenizing marriage licenses here, um, taking taking that time that you had to go into the court and get everything signed and yeah. have to deal with that. So now that's all on the blockchain. It takes a couple of minutes. Uh, very simple. So a lot of yeah. Cool I mean, stuff. even if you, I mean, even if you think of. It, I have this running joke with a group of friends that are in the space that we're going to launch a podcast one day that's called My Parents Have No Idea What I Do for a Living. <laughs> one of the examples we always use that, you know, I always explain to the older generation, right? But if we're talking NFTs, we're talking smart contracts specifically, like think of, you know, if you've ever owned a home, you know, you get to this point in your home ownership where you're going to refinance and that process is usually you see an article on somewhere online of how interest rates have, have decreased and you contact your mortgage person and that person says, well, these are the things you need to do. And you decide that you're going to refinance. And now it's a 45 day closing window and you need to provide them with, you know, all of these assets. And it's a 25, 30, $40,000 process for closing costs. And that's just all of these people in the middle taking their little cut for the work that they do. And it's important work, but you tokenize that and you put it on a blockchain and you write a smart contract. Now that refinance happens immediately. You're always paying your best and your lowest rate. You know, you, you can change the world that way and you can revolutionize things. So again, going back to what you were saying, I mean, there's, there's so many different uses for this. Um, you know, again, it, you know, car records, um, real estate, art, certificate of authenticity. Um, I mean, music, I mean, music is another huge one. I mean, if, if, if you would have, if you would have could have looked back in time, right. And said, Hey, music is going to all be digital and I'm never going to buy CDs at a music store again. Right. You would, people would have thought you were crazy and that's the world we live in. So I, I'm, I'm so bullish on the entire space and what blockchain and NFTs and smart contracts can just do for the way we operate on a daily basis. I mean, it literally eliminates all of those costs. It makes the process immediate and that's how it should be. It gives the power back to the people. Yeah, this, I mean, you know, what you just said that really resonates with me and it's one of the big reasons I got into crypto is because I truly believed in the technology and the power of technology to make systems more efficient, give people the ownership that they have, right? Give people access to more money. Like if you're a singer, like you should get a larger share of your profit. Sure. Um, and so this, you know, absolutely resonates with me. But I guess my one question is, you know, how far do you think we are right now in terms of an industry to there, to that point, right, where NFTs and the blockchain technology is used for those purposes at scale? Um, yeah, it's I think we're a lot further along than we would be. And I think the reason is, is because of COVID, mm -hmm. right? Pandemic swept around the world. Lots of people, including ourselves, were all locked in our homes without a heck of a lot to do. And we were researching, we were reading the internet, right? It was sort of the perfect storm for this space. Now I feel like obviously with, you know, sort of this sort of second crypto winter coming through, um, I think it's a really interesting time because the winter is for building. Right. If we look back at the last crypto winter, some of the amazing projects and companies that came out of it, I think we're, we're on sort of the precipice of a really interesting time in our space. When, when I look at sort of where we're at versus where we can be, um, I, I, like to, I like to view us right now as we're sort of like at the Netscape phase of Web2, right? We've just gotten rid of our cable modems or excuse me, our dial up modems. You know, we're just sort of getting into that world where we're not getting an AOL disk every day. And I think the crazy part is that when you look at that point in time, that wasn't that long ago. Yeah. Right? I mean, that was 20, 25 years ago. And we're getting to the point where everything is pushing so far past that, right? Innovative companies like Tiffany that are going to, you know, use the, the NFT as a 
certificate of authenticity, right? You know, we, we talked earlier about the real estate. Those companies already exist. Um, they're working through it. It's, it's going to take mass adoption for it to get to that point. Um, not going to be a popular thing that I'm going to say, but I think one of the best things that could happen to this space is some sort of regulation. And again, I think that once you get some sort of regulation, a lot of the FUD of the different generations around, is this real? What am I buying? Is this for money laundering? Is this illegal? Right, will go away. And I think that's the biggest thing that we've got to do to get to that point is the educational side. And, and I think, you know, the, the, the upcoming, you know, security designation and those types of things, while might not be the most popular, I think will help the, the, the industry get to that point much faster than it would without it. Yeah, definitely agree. I, saying that. Well, I was just going to say, I think there's a difference between good regulation and bad regulation. Exactly. Uh, what we saw yesterday, I think, uh, at least from my perspective, was bad regulation. Sure. Um, there's definitely some people in Congress that know what they're doing and have thoroughly researched the capabilities of blockchain and distributed ledger technology. And then there are others that are just seeking to gain additional, um, uh, what's the reverse of privacy, um, oversight into, yeah, into yeah. citizens' lives. So that part is frustrating. Um, there's also good things to take away from what happened yesterday. We don't need to get into that. Well, it's the guardrails, right? It's letting people know that this is okay. And, you know, again, the, the older generation, even older than I, right? It's, it's still the, you know, I talked to my father-in-law, I'm like, you should invest in crypto. Well, what am I getting? I'm like, well, what are you getting when you buy shares in IBM? Well, I got a little piece of paper that says that I have shares in IBM, but it's that sort of mentality. It's, I was on a call the other day and I was trying to explain what a digital wallet was. And they're like, well, look, I don't keep my money in a bank. Well, can't you send me a statement from your bank saying you can afford this? No, I don't keep my money in a bank. But again, I think that once this becomes mainstream, right, and whether it's good regulation or bad regulation, hopefully it's all good. But I think that when it shows up on the nightly news, right, when this is talked about as a real tangible thing, I think you're going to see this other generation that, let's face it, has the vast majority of the wealth in our world is going to come into this. And they're going to be the ones that are going to be driving those conversations, as opposed to the kids and the grandkids of the CEOs in the world and the politicians in the world that are really pushing this. Um, you know, it's like we talked about earlier, right? It's, it's the person that goes to a blockchain conference because they were told to go there and learn about it versus the person that understands it and is going there to, you know, revolutionize a product or change the world. So, you know, I have a question about that. And just to follow up, you know, we talked about you going to Bitcoin Miami a couple of years ago. Um, I went to Bitcoin Miami this year. I had a blast. But, you know, the one thing I would say is, you know, I was very inspired by all the people that were there, or at least the mix of people that were there, right? Like there's definitely the trad fires of the world and there was definitely the like crypto native 17 year olds of the world. But the one thing I felt was, you know, we, are, we still are in an industry that, for all its, you know, for all of its talk about keeping, you know, democratizing information and democratizing access is still really keeping people out, right? Whether that's with your cold wallets or your cold storage or the language that we use and the terms that we use, you know, how, how do you think, you know, and I feel like chain kind of really fits into this is like, how do we make this more accessible to people like your father-in-law, right? Like, like my mom who wants to buy crypto, but told me, I don't know what's happening. Why don't, I just give you my money and you buy it. And I said, no, like, I don't, you know, you need to get your own crypto. But, you know, for yeah. her, it just, it felt so complicated to get anything. Yeah, I, I think it's, I think it's going back to what we talked about earlier, right? It's, it's the education, you know, it's people, people traditionally don't like change, right? It's the fear of the unknown. Um, you know, I know with, you know, dealing with, you know, my, my parents and my grandparents, right. It's a, it's a whole different way of thinking than when talking with my kids or, you know, other folks that are on my team that are younger than myself. Um, it's just a different world. And I think, I mean, the obvious answer is at some point in time, you know, we that understand the space will be the old, you know, people in the world and we'll get it. But I think, I think more and more, right. As it becomes more mainstream, as, as you start to see more positive pieces, if you start to see more educational pieces, I think that's going to help. I think that, you know, what we do at chain from a marketing perspective, right. Is really that educational storytelling. You know, the content that we put out is not about buy our product. It's always about, this is something you're going to learn. 
right? We can solve this problem for you. And as human beings, right, if you think about the way you use a service like Google, you'd usually type questions in it and you're looking for an answer. And when we can start to think like that, right, and we can solve these real world problems and, you know, the news media starts to pick up the really positive sides of our world as opposed to just sort of all of the, the negative pieces, which, you know, I think they have a tendency to do more times than not. You know, I think that's when it's really going to sort of make that change and that other generation is going to going to buy into it. Um, you know, and again, I think it's just a generational thing, but I can't wait. Like I said, I've got four young kids. They understand this stuff. Um, my mm -hmm. son is five. Like we buy like Marvel superhero NFTs together, right? Like he's on his tablet reading Spider-Man comic books and like he gets it. It's not a toy he can play with in his hands. It's a toy he plays with in a digital space. And, you know, just like, you know, the kids that grew up never experiencing a world without the internet. These are going to be kids that are going to be growing up and never not experiencing the digital world and the metaverse and, and everything that it involves in that. I think that's a really, really cool thing. So, you know, before we get into more serious topics back again, I have to ask, what's your favorite superhero? Oh my God, my son is in love with Spider-Man. So if, if there's a Spider-Man drop. Two, three, four, five, six. He loves all of them. <laughs> He loves all of them. He's he's five, so he he he, he walks around in his little Spider Man Miles Morales costume and does like this all the time. And oh, that's cute. It's a it's, a, it's a, just a great opportunity to share something with him. And you know, you know, I had comic books growing up, right? And while they still have those, it's now it's digital. So he grabs his little tablet and he flips through, and he doesn't know how to read. But you know, it's something fun for us to do together. And again, it teaches him that things you play with don't have to be physical. So by default, is Spider-Man your favorite? It has to be, yeah. No, no choice there. There's no choice. Understood. Um, maybe. Uh, so one thing you mentioned earlier on the the uh, interview that I was I was particularly interested in. You talk about yeah. chain merging Web two companies into Web three, helping mm -hmm. them with that transition. Um, in my experience, although I mean, um, it hasn't been super in depth in, in the way that you've been in depth. Um, I've seen a lot of companies that maybe don't need to be web three. Um, mm -hmm. Have you run into that at all? And like, yeah, what's your viewpoint there? Yeah, you know, I, I think that I think that there are companies that probably are better off in the web two space. Um, I, I think I think before you can get to that standpoint, right, it really goes back to knowing your customer. Um, it really comes back to understanding, you know, what problems they're trying to solve or what they're interested in. Um, you know, there are some companies that, you know, would do really great in this space. Some of them are talking to you, some of them are not. Um, but I think it's, I think at the end of the day, you know, as a marketer, right, our job is to communicate with people. We need to tell them the story that they want to hear on the platform that they want at the right time. And if your customer base, if your users are in the Web3 space, then as a business, you have a right to those consumers to be there. If they're not, then you need to focus on more appropriate channels. So I think it's case to case by case. I think I think the, the boom over the metaverse and how that's going to change things. And, and we're working with some amazing, amazing partners on some of that and how we can really sort of transform that from the digital to the physical, like we talked about earlier. Um, I think that'll help some, but this isn't a game that everybody has to get into, right? There are, there are companies that didn't have web presence until just a handful of years ago. Um, you know, up until relatively yeah. recently, Apple didn't have social media, right? So they came in it when the time was right, when their customers demanded it, it made sense. Um, this is not a space you want to jump into too early. You don't want to make mistakes because the community can can be harsh, but there's a huge, huge reward there if you do it the right way. Absolutely, it's just timing. I hope, I hope one of those amazing companies you didn't or that you're referring to isn't Facebook. By the way, <laughs> I have no problems with Facebook. I'm sure Mr. Zuckerberg is a very nice man. The NFT setup, I think, is a bit egregious, but. Uh... <laughs> I mean, I guess they could argue that, you know, they have customers who are in the Web3 space and they want to have NFTs and they want to share them with their social media on Instagram. So 
you know, part of part of part of our world, right, is is you take an idea and you throw it up against the wall and you see if it sticks. I mean, there's a lot of times where, you know, we've done that in business before and you've failed and there's a lot of times where you've been successful. Um, you know, I think it's I think it's very bullish for for Facebook now Meta to have invested so much in the metaverse. Um, I think it's great for the space, whether it's going to be successful or not. I don't know. Um, at the end of the day, the beautiful part is, is I'm not the one that decides. It's everybody that buys their products and services. If they, if they like it, they will. If they don't, they won't. And, and that's the beautiful part of of sort of the world we live like we get to say of what's successful and what's not yeah and i guess you know going back to some of your points i think you know it does add credibility when you know zuckerberg changes the name of facebook to meta right and has this whole like one one hour long video with his avatar and showing this like virtual world it you know really makes it it goes from like being a niche kind of industry for yeah. you know a bunch of tech people and tech adjacent people to like something that everybody should be in and thinking about so, you know, I guess, you know, we do want to shift for one second to, um, hold on, actually. No problem. I had um, something good to say there, though. So I, you hit the nail on the head with Meta and Facebook, right? If you look at the users right now of Facebook, they're my parents. They're my grandmother, right? They're not us. They're not my generation. They're not your generation. They're not the kids. So, so the work that Zuckerberg's doing now with Meta is introducing that concept to a whole different generation of people, the same generation that we were just talking about needing to learn more about what this is. And I think that's important. Absolutely. Yeah. So okay. I got excited. You're, you're definitely, uh, yeah, you're definitely opening my mind a little bit. I was, uh, I was definitely harsh there on Facebook, but I, I agree with your points. I don't know if anybody from Facebook is look, it was going to be watching this. So I've got to be, <laughs> that's true. That's fair. Um, and so, yeah, one other question, I mean, this it's related to the, the meta stuff. Um, they will be onboarding web two users into, into web three by doing this effectively in, in a way, I mean, there's really no yeah. decentralization there, but, um, Curious if you're seeing, I mean, you guys are bridging the physical to the, the digital world. So that's definitely helping. But is, are there any like ex exciting opportunities or products coming out that like they kind of hide the blockchain from customers so that it feels like a Web2 experience in a way? Is there anything that Chain's working on in that regard? Oh, man, that's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> that's totally fine, too. I wasn't prepared for that one. <laughs> There's very little I can talk about about what we're currently working on. I can talk vague like I did a little bit earlier. I'm trying to think. It's okay if there's like nothing that, you know, we can also just, we can edit this part out too. Yeah. The only thing, the only thing that I could, the only thing I can think of is, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk has done some really cool stuff in the NFT space. And, you know, he's he's opening this restaurant in New York and a colleague of mine that lives in New York had purchased sort of the ability to become a member of this private restaurant. And it was an NFT and they had tokenized that whole entire process. Um, so when you show up to the door for your dinner, you make your reservation, right? You're you're providing your identity via that digital wallet and the NFT. And I just thought that was a great way of sort of tying that together, right? And, and, and again, I mean, we're seeing a lot of people that are taking that thinking from, say, a security perspective, right? So say, for example, you go to a concert, right? If in order to get into the VIP area, you have a lanyard, right, that says VIP on it. If you can build that into the blockchain, there's no way for it to be there's no way for it to be false, right? You can scan it, you can do whatever you need to do, and it makes that process so much more difficult. So I think those are the really the types of things that, you know, I think are sort of those cool cutting edge pieces right now. And again, like you, they just make sense when you hear them, right? It's like, oh, that makes perfect sense. Instead of having to, you know, show my membership card at a country club or a private club of some sort, right? I'm just showing my NFT. You know, would you would you say it's the same as having, you know, like, a, you know, you have priority pass, for example, or like your airline ticket is just on your phone instead of the physical card? Because, you know, I, you know, I have a membership to a club in New York. And unfortunately, it's not the one you're talking about, because that one sounds <laughs> awesome. And I, I hope I get to eat there one day. But, you know, I do have a physical card right now. And yeah. I guess is the difference to the consumer really just the idea that it's not a physical card anymore. It's it's just a digital card. It's on my you know, it's on my wallet somewhere. 
I, I think I think right now people and you use the airport experience, right? Like, you know, I take my phone and I go up and I put it down and it scans my QR code. Right? A lot of people think that that's the digital side. But what happens if you lose it? Right? What happens if you lose that membership card? It's a whole process. Right. I mentioned earlier certificate of authenticity for collectibles. Right. Like yeah. I've got this jersey here that's signed and I have no idea where their certificate of authenticity is. So I think once I start to understand that it's about it's it's basically, you know, like like the old, you know, safe that your grandparents would have in their, you know, in their closet, right? Or it's the firebox that we keep our passports and our stuff in. Like we're just digitizing all of that and putting it into a space where no matter what device you're on or what restaurant you're at or what club you're at, you can always grab that and pull it down and it just makes it so much easier. And I think that that ease is really what's going to be the difference. Um, QR codes are not blockchain. I'll just end with that. So, you know, just to play devil's advocate here for a second, you know, we talk about the immutability of, you know, blockchain and the fact that you can't, you know, nobody else can take it from you, but People lose their wallet ID and, you know, passwords and their, their, you know, phrases, seed phrases all the time. I've done it. You know, I, I had, you know, a bunch of Bitcoin somewhere and I, and I couldn't find this one sticky note that I wrote the seed phrase on somewhere for like three years, you know, and for all intents and purposes, I'd lost, I'd lost the Bitcoin. So, you know, how, how do we think about that? And how do we think about, you know, it's not that it's not something I can't lose. It's just, it's, I can't lose it. I could lose it, but it just losses. It looks a little bit different. Yeah. And there's the story I was reading a couple of days ago, and it's a continuation. There's a guy that lost like $800 million worth of Bitcoin on a hard drive, and he's searching every single garbage dump in the I tri- looking for it. And again, I think I think you bring up a really great point, right? It's it's not that you can't lose it. It's that it, it adds that layer of protection that makes it more difficult. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I think I think security companies, you know, have a long way to go with what that actual process looks like. Um, you know, my MetaMask wallet is literally in the the firebox that I joked about with the passport, right? So it's like when I die, my wife knows go in there because there's a MetaMask wallet ID in there. But I think as as that world progresses, right, and two factor authentication becomes better, and you know all of those different things, we're all tied to these all the time. And I think that you know that will become easier. I don't know how it's going to become easier, but just like every other part of this, it's going to evolve. I know there's a lot of companies out there that are doing some really cool stuff in that space. Um, but it'll get there. It, it's just like everything else, right? Again, if we if we look back at you know dial-up modems and AOL discs in your mail, I mean, we've come a really really long way from there. And you know, it's the community coming together. And like you say, it's there's a problem. How do we fix it? And they're gonna figure something out that's brilliant. And hopefully, they use chains, products, and services to build it. Yeah, I hope so too. Um, so maybe it makes sense for us to switch over and talk a little bit about the other two products that Chain have. Yes, so I will try. Been... I can't go deep, but I'll try. <laughs> okay. But yeah. So just for everyone listening, the one that we've been talking about, NFT as a service, that's what uh, Tiffany's leveraged for their NFT launch. Um, and then you also have Cloud and Sequence. And uh, to the best of your ability, please, please give us. Yeah, that. yeah, for sure. Th- those two products, those two products are really about solving specific problems. Chain sequence is that sort of ledger as a service, right? It's how do you take and, and build and organize all of those things that, uh, you know, you're going to be pulling from your blockchain. Um, you know, it has the ability to allow you to build. Um, you know, private blockchains, non-permission blockchains. Um, that's originally how our company was was started. Uh, was really around providing enterprises the ability to build their own, um, you know, permissioned and non-permissioned private blockchains. So, so it's a unique offering in the fact that you know it's really designed for developers. And how do you manage that whole entire process? Um, Chain Cloud is is a little bit unique. It's still in beta at the moment. Um, We've got a bunch of really, really great popular blockchains that have signed on, uh, and it's basically going to give you the ability to 
um, you know, run APIs and, and build nodes directly uh, directly on that blockchain and manage them right from there. Um, really great dashboard UI interface. Uh, it's going to make things very, very simple. Um, you know, and, and we're hoping that, uh, you know, once that comes out of beta, which should happen pretty shortly, you know, a lot of developers are going to use that. You know, the, the node side of this is it's complicated. Um, you know, I, I know from past work, you know, node building can be very expensive. It can be very difficult. Um, you know, you've got to get access rights and all of those things. So, so the idea there is if we bring all of those top blockchains together and make that simpler, um, you know, it'll drive more adoption in the blockchain space and allow people to just build really great things and, and make it easier and, and faster to scale. So, you know, at OKCoin Live, we're always searching for some alpha and it sounds like sounds like we have some alpha here. Chain Cloud is about to launch soon. And, you know, would you would you say this is something that our listeners should be looking out for? Yeah, definitely. Like like I said, it's in it's in beta now. Um, we're seeing some really, really great results on the back end. The people that are in it are loving it. Uh, you know, also, like I mentioned, we've got uh, we've got a number of really great blockchains that are partnering with us. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be it's going to be a pretty uh, it's going to be a pretty important launch uh, in the process of, of us trying to build chain. We, we think it's going to really simplify a lot of things for a number of different users in their sort of development, their development experience. Will uh will traditional not traditional everyday users be able to access that product? Like how will they have to buy the chain token to access it? How how does that process? Yeah, work? no, um, it's it's actually going to uh, it'll actually be a free product up until a certain threshold, uh, and then there'll be um, you know then there'll be a user fee based on usage from that point. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, sort of our core is let's offer it up for free and see how people use it. And when you get to the point where you really need to scale, uh, we handle those things at that point in time. But yeah, this is something that everyday users can use uh, at any given time, just like uh, just like our chain sequence product as well. Gotcha. And uh, Very good. just to follow up, yeah. The, the, um, so earlier you mentioned uh, giving some advice to Web2 companies around like which blockchain to use. And I know Chain initially launched on Ethereum. Is there a, a bias there? Um, and if so, would, would love to hear why. <laughs> the, the, the truthful answer, which you shouldn't put in this, is I have no idea Deepak. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Deepak's name on, on Twitter is Deepak. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 So I think it, I think, I think the, I think the honest answer is probably just because it's the most established and it made Tiffany the most comfortable, but I can't, I can't say whether that's truthful or not, to be quite honest. Okay. But the, like going forward, there's other blockchains that you will leverage. Oh yeah. Yeah. We're, we, we're in conversations right now with every major blockchain. Um, you know, the, the beautiful part is that a lot of them are trying to, to push NFT builders to utilize their platforms as well. And what we're finding is that our NFT as a service is actually able to complement them because they're not offering sort of that full white glove service. They're really great at building things on a blockchain and getting the minting done and everything else. But what we offer at Chain is everything outside of that. So, so for example, if we go to, you know, blockchain XYZ, right? They have a client that comes in that wants to do this, but might not have the bandwidth or the skill set to do the rest of it. That that point in time, we get to partner and really build that you know amazing full experience for that brand. And we're finding a lot of that. So there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of blockchains that are excited to to hop on this and, and partner with us because of those reasons. Yeah, awesome. you know, I mean, I will say before before we wrap up this segment, I I think. You know, just having talked to you and having talked to Deepak and just working with the chain team for a few weeks now, I think I think what Chain's doing is really brilliant, right? It's a it's a complicated space and simplifying it for people and not just people for companies. I think I think it's just such a brilliant move. It's it's almost like I would say, you know, don't kill me for saying this, but it's almost like the consulting model, which is yeah, yeah. bringing people on board and explaining and kind of providing that service, being almost like the IBM in some ways of, of crypto. Yeah, and that's the I mean, and that's the beautiful part of, of the team that he's been building out is we all have different skill sets. 
right? Like our, our CTO, uh, our CTO, I, I believe used to be at Coinbase, right? I come from a little bit more of a traditional background with Fortune 500 and those bigger brands, right? He comes from more of a traditional finance and development background. Um, you know, our, our, our director of operations comes from sort of traditional luxury brands. So, so we're able to sort of bring this together. And I, I feel like right now, Right, there really isn't a challenge that we can't handle head on just because we've got this really diverse background that allows us to all sort of jump in and, and be fluid and make decisions quickly. Um, because again, we, we don't have all of that red tape, right? This is our space, we're used to moving quickly, whereas you know a lot of other companies don't understand the speed, right? They don't understand the lingo, like you mentioned earlier. It gives us that consultant type feel where we can sort of walk them through this and, and you know, point out those potholes in the road that they're going to find. And it, it's, it's, it's brilliant. And we're having an amazing time. And, and, you know, all we really care about is doing great work for our clients. Um, generally don't hear a lot from us, um, but we like it that way. You know, we want to we want uh, you know the people that come to us for for guidance and help to really take all those accolades and I think you're seeing that with Tiffany.com or Tiffany and Co right now is you know they're getting some really really great feedback on uh, on crypto Twitter and, and elsewhere. Cool. So in summary, Chain is the IBM of the space. Chain is not an ETH Maxi platform by any means, and Chain, at least the CMO, is one of the most humble people in the space. Boom. And I'm also the oldest person in the space. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I would say four is go buy chain on OKCoin. Nice. Uh, I do not provide financial advice. <laughs> Probably this heard that before. Financial but, advice. Yeah. But you know, I mean, the, the beautiful part about chain, right, is like we care. We're about the people. We're about the community. You know, our, our, our organization is very philanthropic. We have a chain cares division. Um, you know, we've, we've just purchased, uh, we've just purchased a company that was announced a couple weeks ago. That's going to get us very much into the B2C space, which I'm excited about. And, you know, we're, we're trying to grow the right way. We're trying to do the right things. We're caring about the community and trying to support it the best we can. And it's a, it's an honor and a pr privilege to, uh, to work at such a great company and have such great partners like OKCoin. Okay we're, we're so happy to hear that we're, we're really happy to be working with, with chain and with you as well. So, you know, I think on that note, uh, we'll be switching over to our last segment, which is arguably the most fun one. Uh, Harrison and I love sending some, you know, real curveballs your way, but we call this okay, not okay. So okay. we're going to, you know, give you like a sentence or something and you have to tell us really quickly, okay, or not. Okay. Just don't overthink it. You know, just react very naturally. Tell us what you think. So no I'll problem. let you start and then we'll take it from there. Let's do it. Ben Affleck as Batman. Okay or not okay? Not okay. Ooh. <laughs> I agree with you uh, for what it's worth. Okay, next one. I fail all the way. <laughs> Elon Musk's dad bod. Oh, as, as an owner of a dad bod, thumbs up all the way on that one too. Okay there. Just broadly, broadly okay to dad bods. Yes, all the okay in the world. So giving my my dad has a shirt that says I have the body of a god and it has like a fat laughing Buddha on it. So <laughs> just... when, when you're a dad, you never leave. I never leave this chair, so I have no opportunity to work on my dad bod. So it's a good problem. It's a good problem. And then last one. Uh, this is our favorite. We ask everyone this: pineapples on pizza. Absolutely not okay. Oh come on! I'm from Chicago. It's sausage. That's it. With sausage with pineapple? No, no fruit. <laughs> well, I get Mike. Next time you come to New York, we're gonna we're gonna get some New York style pizza. We're gonna get put some pineapples on it, and we'll we'll see what you think. I love New York style pizza. I I love all pizza, but yeah, no, there's no pineapple. <laughs> pineapple on a taco, you might be able to get me on, but not on a pizza. Oh, interesting, interesting. Okay, maybe what a, what about a taco with cheese and pineapple? It's kind of like a pizza, but in a taco. Oh, totally. It's a whole different vessel. It's a, it, yeah. So I guess we draw the line on how much dough does the piece have. Exactly. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Awesome. So thank you so much, Mike, again, for spending time talking to us and telling us about chain and, you know, really having this really interesting, thoughtful conversation about the future of crypto. 
um, you know, where Web2 is going and, you know, what, where we see, you know, chain going in the future. We're so excited about the team and uh, we're so honored to be uh, a part of that journey for, for chain. So uh, for those who are listening, uh, we are offering chain on OKCoin's platform. This is not financial advice, but if you want to believe in the platform and believe in the community, uh, you know, go check it out. And then lastly, you know, follow, follow Mike on Twitter, follow us on Twitter. Uh, I believe Mike, your Twitter is Mike underscore Heron. So that's nope. H E R R O N. It's M Heron five four. So M H E R R O N five four. Um, yeah, and you can follow Chain on Twitter as well as at Chain. Great. So that's uh, M Heron five four on Twitter, and yep. uh, as well as Chain on Twitter. Also follow Deepak. That's Deepak dot um, and then follow Harrison and I. Harrison, I don't actually know what your Twitter account is, so I actually don't even know what my Twitter account is. So <laughs> don't follow us. It's okay. Yeah, you can follow OKCoin on Twitter. It's a great call. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank Thanks you. It was my pleasure.